Okay, our title, The Hairy Mantle, The Authority to Proclaim the Lord. Brethren, the world is really on fire, isn't it? But we think there's more to come. But isn't it amazing also how the Heavenly Father knows what we need? Giving this opportunity for us to be apart from the world and its cares to be with those of like precious faith. He's taking care of us temporally, but more importantly, with our spiritual needs. He's giving that spiritual meat that's been prepared and supervised by him to be, pre to be presented by somewhat of a broken vessel, but happy to serve in whatever he directs. And we pray that these words are, are spoken are of the Lord and will have the influence and blessing of uplifting the hearers. You know, today we want to answer three questions. Is the hairy mantle worn today? If so, by who? And is there still a message to proclaim? at this very late period of the harvest. You know, what got us starting into the study and looking at these things was the Zechariah scripture, 13.4. And it shall come to pass that the day that the prophet shall be ashamed, every one of his vision, when he prophesieth, neither shall they wear a hairy mantle to deceive. And this indicates that there is a limit to sin and deception. And there will be a reckoning for deceivers. And we see society crumbling. And we believe that this text is giving us an indication of a time and events. Yet future. But we'll have a part in answering our three questions. Is the hairy mantle worn today? Is there still a message to be proclaimed? And is someone wearing that mantle? The mantle refers to a cloak or a covering. Mantles also used metaphorically when describing the transfer of power, such as when one takes on the mantle or a new position from someone else. This mantle of, was worn, uh, sorry, was the official garment of the prophet, a cloak that could be made of animal hair and was a garment of distinction worn especially by prophets. The mantle automatically marked a man as a prophet, a spokesman of God, and it was also a symbol of sacrifice and commitment. The life of a prophet was not a luxurious one. And the rough garments were denoting the severity of the divine judgments. You know, the prophets were sent to Israel uh, to warn them when they were in violation of the Lord's uh, commandments and laws. And to do a condemnation of that and bring about punishments. But they also were sent for repentance to show the people how to return back to the favor of the Lord. And all down through the ages, the heavenly father has never left his covenant people, even the world without a prophet or a messenger. You know, as we read in Revelation, to the angel or the messenger of the church is right. Long established are the preachers of righteousness condemning disobedience. You know, Noah was a preacher of righteousness in the world that was. 2 Peter 2.5. Lot preached against Sodom. Peter calls him righteous. 2 Peter 2.7. And then we know that Jonah, Jeremiah, and Daniel spoke as the Lord directed them, condemning cities, peoples, and kings for unrighteousness. You know, the Lord never left Israel without a messenger. You know, when they were in captivity, he gave them, those that went into Babylon, he gave them Daniel. And the ones in the surrounding areas, uh, in the wilderness where Ezekiel was with them. And those in Israel, still in Israel, Jeremiah remained with them. And Jeremiah even went with them to the moment when they went into Egypt and when they proclaimed that they would continue to offer incense to the goddess of heaven. And we know that it was then that the, Jeremiah proclaimed the words of the Lord, you are desolate. And the land was not only desolate, but uninhabitable for the 70 years. You know, and there's a long established uh, false prophets that preached unrighteousness and disobedience for self gain. Nimrod deceived the people to build the tower. We know that Korah rose up against Moses and even Aaron and Miriam questioned Moses' authority. So we learn from this that opposition and persecution are unavoidable when actively in the Lord's service. 
So he who wears the mantle, the authority to proclaim, is given only by God. The Lord's word came through only those that he authorized. 2 Peter 1, 19 to 21. And we have the word of prophecy made more sure, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is a private interpretation, for no such prophecy ever came by the will of man. But men spake from God, being moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Lord makes it clear, no one but he knows the time, and his word will come only through the one that he selects to reveal his plans and purposes in his due time. And we can be sure that when revealed, it will be right on time. And now, with this established, let's go to the hairy mantle so we can fill in some of the details that we talked about in the beginning to answer our questions. And there are two prophets whose experiences and two key events that relate directly to our thoughts today, and we believe are a picture and a type meant for us at the end of the age. And our first is Elijah. And Elijah was sent to God to preach repentance and declare the Lord unto the people. Elijah wore the garments of the Lord's prophet. In 2 Kings 1.8, we're told, he was a man clothed in a coat of hair with a leather band about his body. And then he, King Ahaziah, said, it's Elijah the Tishbite. Elijah's name, or Elias in the Greek, the name signifying God, mighty one of Jehovah, or my God is Jehovah. And that will become relevant and important as we go through this study. Elijah had the authority to declare Jehovah to Israel. And, you know, we, we, one of the, we said we're going to focus in on a key event we think that's relevant to our, our thoughts today. And, you know, there was a time had passed. Israel was out and he reigned for three years. But he was now meeting up with Ahab and to set things straight. And we start in 1 Kings 18, 17 and 19. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is it thou, troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of Jehovah, and thou hast followed the Balaam. Now, therefore, send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of Asherah for a hundred, 400, sorry, that eat at Jezebel's table. And when the people had all gathered, Elijah said, uh, Elijah came near to the people and he said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer. Him. They're not a word. First Kings 18, 21. And I think what this means is that they were satisfied. That's a good idea. Okay, let's see who the real God is. And so, you know, we'll read some of these. Uh, well, first, we'll, we understand the story. Okay, so first, there were two altars that were to be built. The priests of Baal went first, and the plan was that the one God who was able to light that fire was the true God. And so we know that the, the priests of Baal, they, all day long, they had their incantations, whatever they did. I don't know if they had their, their bells ringing and so forth. But, you know, it was coming down towards the end of the day. And Elijah said to him, well, maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's on a trip. He says, scream louder, you know. Uh, maybe he can't hear you. He's probably sleeping. So, and then they even cut themselves and they were bleeding to, to, to maybe show repentance or, to, or some kind of uh, penance to this God that they're hoping will light their fire. And we read in, uh, continuing on here in 1 Kings 18, 36, says, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. And you remember what he did. So he had, he took 12 stones representing Israel, and he built an altar, and he built a trench around it, and he had four barrels of water filled up, poured on there. And they said, one more time, pour it, one more time. So three times he soaked this altar, and he had that bullet ready. And then he says, 
Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. And we know that fire came down and consumed everything. And the people said, and when all the people saw it, they fell on their face and they said, Jehovah is God. Jehovah is God. But there were, we were also told uh, later that there were 7,000 that never bent the knee to Baal that believed this witness. And it shows us that it's important to stand and preach that word and let the people make their decision. Yes, we would trouble Israel. And God said, he that hath my word, let him speak my word. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions. Jeremiah 23, 28. So we want to also note an important piece of this experience. Elijah ended up fleeing for his life. He was being pursued by the queen, uh, Jezebel. She was very upset. And she said, you know, in fact, we know, hey, tell him to mark these words. He'll be dead by this time tomorrow. But she used the influence as a queen and the power of the king and his throne to pursue Elijah. Elijah in this event became a type that the prophet. Six, we're told. It says, Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Malachi's prophecy appeared to apply to our Lord's day, particularly to those living at that time. And this introduces our next uh, prophet. You know, in, in Luke, the first chapter, the angel Gabriel came to Zechariah and he said to him that he would have a son and to call his name John. And continue on in verse 15. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. To the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You know, John 1, verses 6 to 8 says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. And you know what? Matthew 3, 4 tells us, now, John himself had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins, and his food was locusts and wild honey. But, you know, he, John was asked, they came to John. In John 121, it tells us that, so they asked him, what then, art thou Elijah? And he said, I am not. And he says, art thou the prophet? And he says, no. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, to make straight the way of the Lord, as said Isaiah the prophet. You now from reprint 1687 and reprint 3477, John came with the same disposition, the zeal, energy, power, and eloquent persuasion that characterized Elijah. Even his dress and the way he lived were marks of so Um, and he for his forceful teaching attracted the people much more than otherwise would have been that case. John states that he was to make the people ready their ways and were baptized. But John 
would fail to turn all of Israel to the Lord. Our Lord said of John when he was asked, Matthew 17, 10 to 13, and his disciples asked him saying, why then say the scribes that Elijah must come first? And he said, Elijah indeed cometh and shall restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already. And they knew him not, but did unto him whatsoever they would. Even so shall the Son of Man also suffer of them. Then understood the disciples that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. You know, as John fulfilled the antitype of Elijah, proclaiming, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, John 1, 29 and 36. He was also to become a type of the greater Elijah. And talking about John and his work, our Lord tells us in Matthew eleven fourteen 14, that Elijah has come if you receive it. If one believed John's words and accepted Jesus as that long-awaited Savior, for them, the greater Elijah had come. And John would be able to reach some of the people with his message, perhaps some that were later among those in the upper room at Pentecost. But he knew that the Lord must increase while he would decrease. Note also that like Elijah, he was uh, thrown into prison and the queen Herodias used her influence on the power of the throne that caused his death. So what have we seen? Elijah and John, a shadow and a type of the greater Elijah. Both pointed their covenant to the, I'm sorry, both pointed the covenant people to God and to the Lord's anointed. Both were persuaded or pursued by a queen who used her, the power of the throne to persecute God's prophets and disrupt the true message for their own self-preservation. Matthew 11, 11, verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not arisen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And in Hebrews eleven thirty seven and 39, we read, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. All these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So in our Lord's words and Paul, we see that John and the prophets are not the foretold Elijah of Malachi's prophecy, but clearly they did a reformatory work. And we have to also note that both failed their commission, but only because the people would not hear them, not because of their effort. So the, who is this promised Elijah? Our Lord has led to us that it would, it's something different. And, and you all, I know, know this. But we're trying to link, link who this is. And we looked at the Song of Solomon, starting in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Thine oils have a goodly fragrance. Thy name is as oil poured forth. Therefore, do the virgins love thee? Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will make mention of thy love more than of wine. Rightly do they love thee. I am black, but comely. O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. So we're given this beautiful poetic picture telling about the relationship of our Lord and his church, his bride. And where do we see the hair mentioned? Before we say that, but we believe he's talking about those that are, if ye are, you be in Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3.29. Now, where do we see the hair mentioned? It's the goat's hair curtain of the tabernacle. You know, and it wasn't a skin, it was woven cloth. And it predicted, it depicted a living sacrifice. Remember, 
It says the women in Exodus 35, 26, that the women who had the knowledge made the goat's hair into cloth. And they, these were woven. And it's, I think it's very critical to show that it's not a skin. You know, the Lord, and, and what's also amazing, this is what really uh, got me, and I hope we're going to bring it across the right way to you, that before the prophets and Elijah and John, God had already determined to show who the antitypical Elijah, the mighty ones of Jehovah would be. And we can surely see the love the Heavenly Father has toward us and all those that have named the name of Christ down through this gospel age and during this acceptable time. It's the bride, and she's been part of God's plan from the very beginning. I thought it was wonderful, modeling the, the, the garment of the prophets after the tabernacle. You no, know, our Heavenly Father's word is alive, and his word is life. And remember in Genesis 3.21, it says, And Jehovah God made for Adam and for his wife coats of skins and clothed them. The skins showed that a death had to take place to cover them. A perfect life for a perfect life. And we think that that's an indication from that particular scripture in the skins. And that's why we believe, as we're shown in Romans 12.1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable God, which is your logical or reasonable service. So we're seeing that it was a living, it had to show life, and hair shows that. It doesn't depict death. So we believe the 144,000 represented in the goat's hair curtain are given that mantle to proclaim the Lord's presence. And you know all the details about it. If, if you look at the parameter of the curtains and the areas, and you can use one to calculate with Jehovah's number, you come up with 144,000. And if you use our Lord's number, you come up, which is 100, you come up with 144,000. It's, it's a beautiful picture there. And it's a wonderful study if you haven't looked into it. So question answered. The church is the Elijah in the flesh. Now to proclaim the presence of the Lord to spiritual Israel and to also call, even in name only, and to be a witness to the world in general. It's amazing to me, as we thought about this, how the Heavenly Father truly set the elements of the tabernacle as an example for all things concerning restitution. Here we see the covering made of hair woven and how all the prophets wore garments of hair. So this picture of the mantle started with the tabernacle to depict those of the Christ in the flesh that would proclaim the presence of the Lord, having been given the word of reconciliation. And the elect is to proclaim the truth. We're told in Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bring forth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bring good tidings of good, that publish salvation, that say unto Zion, thy God reigneth. As Elijah declared and revealed the true living God over Baal, as John declared, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, so too the antitypical Elijah proclaims the presence of the Lord at the end of the harvest. Though the world's look for a physical manifestation, those who have ears to hear and eyes to see respond to the message as the 7,000 that did not bend the knee to Baal, and a faithful remnant of the nation of Israel that recognized Messiah at our Lord's first advent. So this brings up another question. Will the antitypical Elijah succeed where Elijah and John failed? John 3.28 says, Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am set before him. He must increase but I must decrease. The master says, work while it's still called day. For the night comes when no man can work. It says, labor not for the meat that perishes, but for that which endures unto everlasting life. John 9, 4 and John 6, 27. So then in the present due time, we see that Elijah the prophet came as foretold before the great and notable day of the Lord. And we hear his closing testimony like that of John, saying, There standeth one among you, whom you know not, whose fan is in his hand, 
and he will thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the garner and burn up the tares, as tares, not as men, with unquenchable fire in the great time of trouble. The curse which must needs come to prepare the way of the great king of kings, he must increase, but the Elijah must decrease and finally be entirely restrained. Not only do we hear the testimony from a few of the Elijah class now, but everyone, everyone who is of the Elijah class will ere long be found proclaiming this message and engaging in the Elijah work. Such only as are thus faithful will be of the glorified Elijah, permitted to share in the work of restitution of all things, which during the millennium will be a grand success. That's from volume two, page 264 and 65. You know, the church is not a fleshly class. We have consecrated to go up to him without the camp, bearing his reproach to suffer and die. As the salt of the earth goes beyond the veil, we see society crumble. The increase is on the other side as the members of the body decrease this side of the veil. And that's a good thing because we want that kingdom to come. So what's going on now to bring about this, this uh, trouble for the church at the end of the age? Well, just a few things, some ideas. Recently in Russia, the newest law that's been passed, no evangelizing outside of church. And this took place in July. The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, approved a package of anti-terrorism laws that usher in tighter restrictions on missionary activity and evangelism. Despite prayers and protests from religious leaders and human rights activists, the Kremlin announced Putin's approval yesterday. The amendments include laws against sharing faith in homes, online or anywhere but recognized church buildings, and it went into effect July 20th of this year. Being found guilty, one will pay a substantial fine, but they're also subject to five years hard labor. Additionally, the Archbishop, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church in Russia, condoned Putin's war in Ukraine, called it a holy war. But with the victory, the cleric would gain a vast increase of his diocese. Violence in Christians around in Europe has been increasing. Anti-Christian violence is the most widespread in France, where vandalism is occurring at an average rate of three reported events a day. And that's according to the government statistics. In Germany, they're close behind at two every single day throughout the country. One other place, the laws in India restrict conversion to Christianity. And this went into effect as of November, 2012. The International Christian Concern made a note, anti-convention, I'm sorry, anti-conversion laws in India meant to stop conversion by force or being used specifically against Christians to restrict all conversions. Many Hindu officials use these laws as a means toward making conversion to Christianity illegal. This law would essentially make Mother Teresa a criminal mastermind in India. The religious makeup of India is important to consider. The country has 28 states, a population of 1.2 billion people, and 90% of the population is Hindu, and a mere 2.6% is Christian. Yet because of fear over the potential power of the Christian message and its appeal to the uh, pervasively oppressed 150 million Dalits or formerly called the untouchables, they who make up the bottom rung of the Hindu caste system, extreme measures are necessary to prevent mass conversion. And this includes enacting the kinds of laws described above also, along with beatings, threats, intimidation, and the murder of converts uh, to Christianity, and this is on a daily basis there. In 2020, the religious freedom uh, situation in India deteriorated to such a degree that the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom recommended India be designated a country of particular concern, a designation reserved for the world's worst violators of religious freedoms. So that brings us to the, what we feel, the smiting of the Jordan. 2 Kings 2.8, and Elijah took his mantle and he wrapped it together and he smote the waters and they were divided hither and thither so that they too went over on dry land. And the smiting of the waters, the symbol of 
of this of water in biblical uh, language is it represents both truth and people. And Brother Russell felt that this pictures a mighty work yet to be accomplished, and apparently in the very near future. Now, he wrote this over 100 years ago, but we can see how things have heated up. But he did expect another message that would go out and reprint 5950. The church will use what it is in their hand, the power and authority of the truth, the power of God, in smiting the waters of the peoples who will be judged by the truth. The smiting will probably affect the whole civilized world. The people will be divided, and it'll be very clear who has the truth. Some will be rejecting it, and, and the message will be so contrasting that it will identify the differences and understanding uh, very clearly. And once delivered, we would expect, as in John's case, the queen and daughter systems will use their ruling authority to stop the message, and then we expect the complete church to be beyond the veil. Brethren, if the worst happens, remember, the Lord is in charge. A whirlwind is a type of trouble. In 2 Kings 2.11, we're told it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. You know, the Elijah class caught up in power and great glory, the spiritual exaltation of the church. That's what we're all hoping for. That's our, our desire. A figure of victory and glorious escape from the whirlwind of trouble. Ours is the real deliverance by chariots of victory and divine power from death. The fire may signify that the last members of the church will be separated under very trying circumstances, go through some very fiery trials and persecutions and violence, perhaps. The close of the church's career in the flesh will come suddenly and abruptly. And we expect that the church, the antitypical Elijah, will have passed beyond the veil before the anarchy predicted in the Bible. Reprint 5794. The transfiguration of Elijah was a picture or vision of the change of the church at the end of the age. Many of the people will be taken from the present life in some kind of anarchistic man, uh, movement. Fierce trouble agitating the heavens or Ecclesiastes' power. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be burned, uh, turned unto fables. Yes, the time is probably not many years distant when repressive measures may be brought to bear against every effort of the saints to spread the good news of the coming kingdom. All on the plea that the general interests and the public welfare demand such a course. Volume 2, page 263. The same necessity for restricting liberty on political and social questions that we're seeing today will probably be supposed to apply equally to the freedoms of expression of religion, uh, which really lie at the foundation of all liberty. It would not be surprising if a strong government, a monarchy, would someday replace this present great republic. And it is entirely probable that one common standard of religious beliefs will be deemed expedient and will be promulgated to teach outside of which will be treated and punished as a political offense. Such a persecution would not only furnish in the end of the harvest of this age, another parallel to the harvest of the Jewish age, but would also give a wider and deeper significance to the words of the apostle Paul and John and to and to the typical illustration of the close of the early career of the church as represented in Elijah's whirlwind departure and John the Baptist's imprisonment and beheading. Volume two, page 264. Revelation 13, 17. And that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. We should be so prepared so armed and so thoroughly furnished with the invincible truth that persecution would move us only to greater zeal and not lead us through surprise or fear to lower our standard. Nor to surrender when the kings of the earth stand up and with the religious rulers of the people are gathered against us and against the truths to which God has granted us the privilege of witnessing as his servants and ambassadors. Such reflections 
relative to the future, contrasted with the privileges in, of the present, should serve to stimulate every consecrated child of God to make diligent use of the present grand harvest opportunities and the privileges, remembering that he that reapeth receiveth wages as truly as he that planted and watered, and that now is preeminently a time for gathering fruit until eternal life. The little quiet of the present favorable time with its greater liberties and advantages in every way is divinely arranged in order to the sealing of the true servants of God in their foreheads, intellectually with the truth. What has Zoom done for us? You know, what a blessing it's been. I mean, sometimes we go to five conventions a year. We can go to 50. There's one every weekend. And the, and the information that we're gathering is incredible. You know, I'm seeing the differences from brethren and their understanding. There was a big gap. I don't see it. It's, it's, it's hard when you go to talk to someone. I'll, I'll, I think, oh, I've studied something. I'm going to go talk to somebody about a subject. They already know all about it. They're explaining it better than I could. So I, I think that's what the Lord's plan was. He's given us this quiet time of peace to build that knowledge, to be ready, because we're going to be proved. And he wants us to be ready. We have to be well armed with the foundation doctrines and faith fortifying promises. And this has been a quiet time. We will be proved, brethren. And remember that even if the worst were to happen, the Lord's in charge. But what about the deceivers? The queen that pursues Elijah class through the power of the ruling authority. We'll go back to that Zechariah 13, uh, 4. And it shall come to pass in that day that the prophet shall be ashamed, every one of his vision, when he prophesieth, neither shall they wear a hairy mantle to deceive. But he shall say, I am no prophet. I am a tiller of the ground, for I have been made a bondman for my youth. And one shall say to him, what are these wounds uh, between or in thine hands? Then he shall answer, those are with which I was wounded in the house of my friends or lovers. You know, Brother Russell brings this out in reprint 2338, page 20, uh, 218, and is asked a question on that, uh, Zechariah 13, 6. And he says, it would seem to imply that in the day of trouble already commenced, that there will be a general change of front on the part of religious teachers who will be so greatly ashamed of the false gospel which they have proclaimed that they will desire to disavow their previous occupation. In this view, the wounds would seem to indicate severe usage received by them from their uh, former flocks. You know, the revolution will be so great that these pretenders shall become ashamed of their claims and strip off the outward token of their occupation. The people will see through the false teachings and the prosperity ministry. The hand is a symbol of power, and the wounding of the hand would seem to imply injury or destruction of the power or influence once exercised by these shepherds. We're coming close to our time, brethren. Preaching and teaching by the church class is well-established feature of God's plan. Remember the commission our Lord gave in Matthew 28, 19? Make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command. And we have to remember, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's proof of sonship. Romans 10, 9 to 11. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. This is the proving time, the acceptable time, as Paul tells the Corinthians. Will we declare the truth to tell it for all to hear? We are not ashamed. And how long do we proclaim the truth? Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be waste without habitant, inhabitant, and the houses without man and the land be utterly desolate, Isaiah 6, 11. Our message of the ransom, resurrection, restitution, to find the last grains, justification, sanctification, and glorification. Elijah and John came before to provide us an example to show us the importance of the last days and the message to be given. And at what cost? Whatever it takes to the laying down of our fleshly life as that living sacrifice. 
Finished only when the Lord takes the offering off our hands and says it's enough. I think we're approaching our time here, brethren. Let us not be ashamed to proclaim the word. 2 Timothy 1, 8 to 10. Be not ashamed, but be a partaker of the suffering. Have been called with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purposes and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the time eternal, but hath known now been manifested by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and incorruption to light through the gospel. And brethren, we know that the Lord, if we, we have to increase our faith. When we're out there about his business, the Lord is there to catch us, to lift us up and set us above the trouble. We can rest in his peace. We have received the anointing to bring us into understanding and fellowship with our Lord. Joint heirs, if we suffer with him, we will reign with him. The privilege to fill up that which is behind of the afflictions with Christ. That we shall, we will know that we will be like him as appearing, sharing his glory, honor, and immortality. Unto you it's given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without all these things are one parable. With an earnest desire to understand every word of God is an evidence that we belong to the kingdom class. Mark 4, 11, reprint 37, 63. Brethren, we're going to push to our close. Be thou faithful unto death and receive the crowning life. Revelation 2, 10. Revelation 19, 8. And it was given unto her that she should array herself in fine linen, bright and pure. The church will have their own righteousness now. No longer need to be covered by our robes of our Lord Jesus. Psalm 45, 13 and 14. The king's daughter within the palace is all glorious. Her clothing is inwrought with gold. She shall be led unto the king in embroidered work. Brethren, it's our prayer for each of you that we fulfill our vows faithfully to hear the well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord that we may take the name of our Lord as part of the bride to have our new name as New Jerusalem, to teach the people holiness and to be known to them as the Lord of righteousness, the Melchizedek priesthood to bless and restore them back to the Father, that they, that he will be all in all. A reward glorious for a work restoring divine order for our Abba Father. Selah. Think on these things. And amen, brethren.